now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We haven't had an episode of Groucho on for a while. The uh, comedy quiz show You Bet Your Life, starring Groucho Marx, going back to March 22nd, 1950. And shh, listen carefully. George Fenneman's going to tell you what the secret word is. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is money. M-O-N-E-Y. Really? You bet your life! The DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America present Groucho Marx in You Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here he is, the one, the only... Don't be afraid, he's harmless. Hey, that's me, Groucho Marx! Thank you, thank you. Well, here I am again with $1,500 for one of our couples tonight. George Fenneman, who gets first whack at it? We invited some railroad conductors and some longshoremen to the show tonight, and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected conductor Carl Putt and longshoreman Clarence Blake. Gentlemen, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, gents, to your bet your life. And if either of you says the DeSoto Plymouth secret word, he wins $100 in cash instantly. It's a common word, something you use every day. A conductor and a longshoreman, eh? Uh, conductor, where are you from? Uh, originally from Des Moines, Iowa. Tell me, who do you conduct for, the Los Angeles Philharmonic? <laughs> I'm a conductor for the Union Pacific Railroad. What train do you work on? Uh, city of Los Angeles. Uh, where do you go on your train? I handle a run from uh, Los Angeles to Las Vegas, Nevada. The city of Los Angeles goes to Las Vegas? <laughs> the city of Los Angeles goes all the way to Chicago. <laughs> Must leave an awful big hole between Glendale and Long Beach. <laughs> well, that's where the city was yesterday. I was looking for it. <laughs> Longshorm and uh, Blake is your name? Uh, where, where are you from? Uh, uh, originally from Rome, New York. How, how long a uh, showman are you, Mr. Blake? <laughs> I don't think I know what you mean. Well, frankly, I don't know what I mean either. <laughs> Let's have another go at it, huh? <coughs> How long do you have to be to be a longshoreman? Huh? Oh, not very, very much. <laughs> you mean size has nothing to do with it, huh? <laughs> then you could be a short longshoreman, huh? I suppose so. Longshoreman, where, where do you work? Uh, down in San Pedro. And, uh, where in San Pedro do you work? On the docks. <laughs> I thought the docks worked on each other, huh? <laughs> What made you decide to become a longshoreman? Was it an urge to do a uplifting work? Or? No, uh, I believe I love I love the water. Mm-hmm. Get that in the bathtub. <laughs> you like the ocean, huh? Yes, like, I do. You like the sea. Why aren't you a sailor instead of a landlubber? Well, that's not a very good way to raise a family. That's not necessarily true. Fish manage pretty well. Huh? <laughs> How far out to sea do you do you get as a longshoreman? Huh? Oh, about twenty-five feet. <laughs> Clarence, your anchor is dragging. Eh? <laughs> now tell me, whistle stop. <laughs> what are your duties as a, as a conductor? Well, to uh, collect the tickets, see that the space is properly assigned, and to maintain the schedule. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I thought the engineer maintained the schedule. No, uh, I'm the head of the train. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> You're the cow catcher, in other words. <laughs> Let's take an average day. What's the first thing you do when you report for work in the morning? Uh, compare your watch with a standard clock, and uh, you check against inferior and superior trains. Well, how do you tell an inferior train? Is it uh, <laughs> come from the wrong side of the tracks? <laughs> what time does your train stop at San Bedou? Uh, uh, in which direction? 
going along the track. Uh, isn't that the customary direction? Well, I mean uh, going east or west. It doesn't make any difference. East is east and west is west. <laughs> and never the train shall meet. <laughs> well, tell me, Conductor, what was your most unusual experience uh, on your train? Well, uh, perhaps the most unusual was uh, having babies arrive while en route. You had a baby on en route? Well, yes, I've uh, had two or three. Well, was it an upper or a lower berth? <laughs> well, tell me, uh, did you throw the kid off because he didn't have a ticket? Or... <laughs> no, the new arrival and the mother was put off at the first stop for hospitalization. Oh, I see. That was probably the first time your train ever had an arrival ahead of schedule. <laughs> Now, incidentally, suppose you're racing along and the stalk decides to make a landing on your caboose and you have to stop the train. How do you instruct the engineer? We have a system of uh, whistle signals. I have a whistle signal, too, but no one stops for it. Huh? <laughs> uh, well, one whistle, when running, means uh, look to your orders. Well, what do, you, do you stick your head out the window and whistle? Or? No, we have a system of air whistles within the train. You pull a cord. Okay, well, what's two, what's two whistles? Two whistles when standing means to start. Two whistles when running is stop the train at once. You Three throw the kid off, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and what, what's the next one? Three whistles. Three whistles when standing is back the train. Three whistles when running is stop at the next station. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like you're always on a toot on that train. <laughs> How do you get the train started again? Uh, we give the engineer a highball. No wonder you're always on a toot, huh? <laughs> what time does your train stop at San Badu? <laughs> Yesterday it was uh, 721 westbound and 621 eastbound. I don't know what it is today. Oh. Well, as soon as it stops, will you signal for a highball for me? <laughs> <laughs> now that I know all about railroads and longshoremen, you're going to get your chance to win a lot of money. You bet your life. <laughs> And while Groucho enjoys his highball from the engineer, we'll take a break. March 22nd, 1950, you bet your life here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. Now more of Groucho Marx and you bet your life. March 22nd, 1950. <laughs> Now, let's see if you two will get a chance at the $1,500. Fenneman, tell them the rules. Each of our three couples has $20. They bet as much of that 20 as they want on each of four questions. The couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question at the end of the show. Our other two couples are in a waiting room off stage, so they don't know what's happening out here. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected farm animals and birds as your category. Is that right? Now, you got $20. Here's your first question. How much will you bet? $10. What kind of a farm animal is an Aberdeen Angus? cow. A cow is right. And they're off to a great start with $30. You conductor, you've been looking out the window. That's it. <laughs> All right, now you got $30. What, uh, how much are you going to bet? 20. $20. What kind of a farm animal is a percheron? It's a horse. It's a horse is right. <laughs> they're climbing, they have $50. You stevedore, you've been loading horses, haven't you? <laughs> All right, now you got $50. Here's your third question. How much of the 50 will you try? Forty. Forty. Forty dollars? What kind of a farm animal is a Toggenberg? T-O-G-G-E-N-B-U-R-G. -G -E I think it's a goat. A goat is right. <laughs> They're really climbing now. They have ninety dollars. How much of the ninety are you going to try? Fifty. Fifty, Fifty is right. Fifty dollars. What is a pole in China? Pig. Pig. A pig is right. And they wind up with one hundred and forty dollars. <laughs> Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Don't run away now. You might get a chance at the big question. Groucho, the secret word is still money. Perhaps the next couple will say it. Just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected a housewife and a gardener, and here they are. Mrs. Sarah Pinola and Mr. Arthur Anders meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, welcome, folks, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. 
And if one of you says the secret word while we're talking, he wins $100 in cash. It's a common word, something you use every day. A housewife and a gardener, eh? Uh, Mr., uh, what is it, Anders? I presume you're the gentleman who does the gardening. Yes, sir. Are, are you married? Yes. Since you're a gardener, I'll bet I know what pet name you call your wife. Something you grow in your garden, it begins with a P. You know what I'm thinking of? Mm-hmm. Petunia? <laughs> no, I was thinking of pumpkin. <laughs> but you know your wife better than I do. By the way, what's your... <laughs> By the way, what's your, what's your wife's first name? Peggy. No, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> what, what's your hometown, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Panola? Racing, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. What sort of work does your husband do? Uh, he works for Los Angeles Transit Line, a bus driver. Mm-hmm. Uh, how'd you meet him? I met him in a shooting gallery where I was working. <laughs> was he half shot at the time? <laughs> no, oh. he was very happy when he walked in. Oh. <laughs> how was he when he left? Huh? <laughs> what do you mean he was at? What were you doing at the shooting gallery? I was working. Uh, were you one of the clay pigeons? I was pigeons? loading up. No. <laughs> I was loading up the guns and oh. taking their money. Sarah, you just said money, and that's tonight's secret word, so you just won $100 in cash. Compliments of the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. I bet you think money really grows on trees, oh. huh? <laughs> now, what were we discussing before you shook that money tree, huh? How I met my husband. <laughs> oh, yes. You were loaded in the gallery. Huh? <laughs> what was your husband doing there? Uh, he was taking an evening stroll. And to a shooting gallery? <laughs> no, he passed the shooting gallery. Uh-huh. So he saw a girl working there, which was me, and he thought... Well, he's going to have some fun. He's pretty shrewd, isn't he, huh? <laughs> the minute he saw you, he said, that's a girl, huh? <laughs> you can't fool old man Panola. He knows he's... <laughs> <laughs> so? So, he wanted to fool me, and he says, uh, I bet I can outshoot you. But he didn't know what was coming. I says, okay. I says, see if you can outshoot me. So we, he shot about... Is this verbatim? <laughs> <laughs> he bought about $5 worth of shots. It, he'd take one round, and I'd take one round. And I kept beating him. He said, oh, he was mad. He put his hands in his pocket. He walked out. He was real mad. Then the next night he comes, I outshot him again. That went on for about a week. Well, he didn't well how much, much did he spend by that time? No, he, he must have spent about $35 that week. Well, he was single. He could afford it. I see. <laughs> So, by this time, you were beginning to suspect that... Uh, yeah, so I said, oh, there's, there's more to it than that. Mm. So he, more, There's more to it than meets the bullseye, you say. <laughs> he says, I'm taking you out. He says, I'm going to show you. He says, you can outshoot me on live game. He says, I'll marry you. I kind said, of a well, curious proposal, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we went, and I couldn't shoot at you all. You went where? Where'd you we go? went hunting. Uh, it's in pheasant country up in Wisconsin. Oh. So we went hunting pheasants, and I'm ashamed to say I couldn't shoot a live game. Boy, he was good, though. He could shoot. <laughs> but he says, I won't break your heart, honey. He says, I'll marry you anyway. <laughs> and did you love him by this time? Oh, yeah. I liked him quite a bit. Uh-huh. <laughs> how, how old were you when, when all this happened, when you got married? Fifteen. Fifteen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's hard to shoot a pheasant when you're fifteen. I guess. Now, tell me, uh, Mr. Anders, are you, you're still here, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Thought maybe you'd gone to seed. Uh... <laughs> as, as a gardener, uh, whom do you work for, uh, Mr. Anders? Well, I work for myself. You're in business for yourself, yeah. huh? Develop your business by running it into the ground, eh? <laughs> now, tell us, Chris, uh, that, that's short for chrysanthemum. Uh... <laughs> do you know how to spell chrysanthemum? Well, it's C-H-R. Well, you don't have to know how to spell them. (laughs) Mr. Anders, I'm aware of that, but... uh, (laughs) Where's your factory? On Flower Street? Uh, I don't have a factory. Fine gardener doesn't even have a plant, huh? (laughs) Specifically, what do you do in your job? Oh, mow lawns, put in sprinkling systems. I can't call any mow lawn. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Have you planted anything in your garden lately, Sarah? Yeah, um, 
I saw a cactus by some people we know, and I liked it, so I dug it out of their yard and made a hole in mine and put it in there. <laughs> Where were the people? They were home. <laughs> well, how did you plan? You just dig a hole and I stick it in I dug a hole and put it in. I said, either it grows or it dies. So I don't know. <laughs> Sarah, that's a pretty cynical attitude. Uh, <laughs> was she doing it the proper way, uh, Mr. Anders? Well, that's about right. It doesn't take too much knowledge to raise a cactus. <laughs> I guess the big trick is stealing the plant, huh? <laughs> Are any flowers blooming this early in the year, Mr. Anders? Well, there's quite a few early bloomers on the stand. <laughs> You mean on a windy day, huh? <laughs> you say there are quite a few uh, early bloomers. Do you ever find any ants in those early bloomers? <laughs> <laughs> this has been all been very educational, Mr. Anders, and you too, Sarah. Now let's see if a gardener and a housewife will get the chance at the DeSoto Plymouth fifteen hundred dollar question. You run your $20 into more than the other couples, and you get the chance. I can't tell you how much the first couple won, but Fenneman is off stage to remind our listeners. The conductor and the longshoreman earned $140. You ready? Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your $20. You selected songs about the weather. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, how much of the 20 are you going to try? Ten. Give me the title of this weather song. Play, Jerry. <laughs> Groucho. How much of the 30 will you try? 20. What is the name of this song? Okay, Jerry. On April Showers. April Showers. They're quite now at $50. Oh, now you got $50. Here's your third question. How much of the 50 will you bet? 40. $40. Right. Is that all right with you? Here we go. Play it, Jerry. We're having a heat wave. We're having a heat wave. Now they have $90. All right, you've zoomed up to 90 bucks. Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 90? 80. 80 dollars. Give me the title of this song. Play, Jerry. No, Stormy Weather. Stormy Weather is right. And they wind up with 170 dollars. Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Now, we'll soon know who gets the chance at the $1,500 question. Fenneman, who's ahead? Well, the housewife and the gardener are leading with $170, and the secret word is still money. Just before we went in the air, our studio audience selected Miss Margot Heister, a 10-cent store clerk, and Mr. J.C. Solomon, a diamond merchant. And here they are. Folks, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers, and if one of you says the secret word, he wins $100 instantly. It's a common word, something you use every day. Solomon, eh? J.C. Solomon, eh? You're the diamond merchant, eh? Right. Where are you from, uh, J.C.? Chicago. Thought maybe you'd be a stone's throw in Los Angeles, since you're in the diamond business, huh? That's right. You're from the Miss Heister? You're from the ten cent store? Yes, I am. Which one? Huh? Chris on Hollywood Boulevard. Pretty fair looking dish to be in ten cent store. <laughs> but, uh, what's your hometown, uh, Margot? Sun Valley. Sun Valley, Idaho? Are you a good skier? No. You never did any skiing? No. Then? That's the way it goes. Huh? <laughs> People in Brazil never drink coffee. Huh? People here can't afford it. Huh? <laughs> uh, are you married, Margot? Yes, I am. Well, let's talk about diamonds, huh? <laughs> Tell me, uh, J.C., do you ever hand out samples? I never hand out samples. You don't give any diamonds don't away, don't give huh? diamonds away. Haven't you ever given just a tiny little diamond to a beautiful girl? Yes, I did once. <laughs> You slippery old dog, you. <laughs> Did you ever see that girl again? Yes, I do. I married her. <laughs> Was that to get the diamond back? <laughs> do you handle anything besides diamonds, uh, Mr. Solomon? Yes, I do. Rubies, sapphires, emeralds. Precious stone once cost me 500 bucks. Did I get uh, gypped? Well, what kind of a stone did you buy? I didn't buy any. The doctor didn't say he charged me $500 for removing it. <laughs> what, what are the semi-precious stones? Well, they are opals, tourmalines, 
Aquamarine. I thought that's something you found under your house. Huh? Aquamarine. <laughs> what color are opals? Opals are a variety of colors. Every color under the sun is an opal. That isn't true. Opals are only pink. I watched her hanging them on the line only this morning. Huh? <laughs> That's what she said. March 22nd, 1950. Groucho Marx, you bet your life. Thanks so much for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these messages from your favorite radio station. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better. Mike Lindell and MyPillow launching the MyPillow 2.0. Now, when Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he's discovered a new technology that makes MyPillow even better. Of course, the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, but now with brand new fabric with a temperature-regulating thread, it's the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. Say goodbye to tossing and turning and flipping your pillow over in the middle of the night. And more great news on the MyPillow 2.0. Buy one, get one free offer with my promo code Wyatt. MyPillow 2.0 is 100% made in the USA, 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square to receive the MyPillow 2.0, buy one, get one free offer, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of You Bet Your Life, Groucho Marx, March 22nd, 1950. Which is the most valuable of all the stones, Mr. Solomon? I should judge a diamond is about the most valuable stone. Why, is, why are they so expensive? Is such because a big they demand? are in demand. They are in demand. Well, certainly is at my house, I know. <laughs> we don't have any diamonds at my house, but there's certainly a big demand for them. <laughs> How much do you charge for the average diamond? Well, they run anywhere from $50 to $3,500 per carat. It's a lot of money for a carat. <laughs> I don't see how those rabbits can afford them. <laughs> I think I'd better get back to figures I'm more accustomed to. Uh, hello, uh, Margo. How are you? <laughs> what kind of rings are in greatest demand at your store? Well, I think I'd say engagement and wedding rings. I know a certain gardener who bought one of your rings. Maybe that's why he's got a green thumb now. <laughs> Do you sell diamonds and emeralds and rubies in your dime store? Yes, we do. Hundreds of them every day. You do? Uh, how much would you charge me for a diamond bracelet? A little one, I mean. Various prices. It's according to quality, up to a dollar. <laughs> well, that's very reasonable, Mr. Solomon. How can you have the nerve to charge thousands of dollars <laughs> for a diamond when Margot here sells them for a buck? Well, she sells you pure crystal glass. Do you have any stones that would look good on me? Oh, yes, I have a very nice stone that will look good on you. (laughs) No, I wasn't referring to a tombstone. I think I'll stick to Opal. She's more on my line. Well, I learned a lot tonight uh, from you two about dime store diamonds. Now you're going to try for a chance at the $1,500 question. You beat our other two couples and you win the chance at all that money. I can't tell you how much the other two couples won, but Fenneman's going to remind our listeners. The housewife and the gardener are ahead with $170. Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your $20. You selected nicknames of cities as your category. Is that right? Your $20. How much are you going to try and talk right out loud into the microphone? Ten. What city is called the biggest little city in the world? The biggest little city in the world. Uh, Take a guess. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's Reno. Remember, you're going for $1,500 tonight. Now, how much of the time will you try? I'll try five. Five? What city is called the Mile High City? Yeah. It, no, the Mile High City is the uh, Big Bear Lake. No, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, you had the right altitude, but the wrong town. <laughs> it's Denver. They have $5, Rocho. How much are you going to bet? Three. Three. <laughs> What city is called the city of brotherly love? Mm. 
Well, now you're down to two dollars. It was Philadelphia. Oh, might as well. It was Philadelphia. Should have known that from cream cheese. Now you're down to two dollars. <laughs> okay, here's your last chance to beat the other couple. Yeah. <laughs> If you can beat the other couples with two dollars, Mr. Solomon, yeah. you're a pretty shrewd cookie. You know how much you gonna bet? All of it. All of it. <laughs> now let's not go mad here. Right? How about a dollar ninety, Mark? Make it the whole two dollars. The whole two dollars. Which uh, what city is called the Windy City? Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> And they wind up with four dollars. Well, now wait a minute. I don't want you to crawl away from here with only four dollars. I'm going to give you one more question. You get it right, and you're going to win ten dollars. Remember, no coaching, please. You ready? Okay. Now put your thinking cap on. Who is buried in Grant's tomb? General Grant. General Grant. Margot got it. But they won four dollars, and that means the housewife and the gardener get the chance to the Soto Plymouth fifteen hundred dollar question. And here is the housewife and the gardener, the winning couple, all ready for the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question, Groucho. All right, you ready, Sarah? <coughs> yeah. Get your gun ready. <laughs> here we go for $1,500. Ready? I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you, so think carefully and please, no help in the audience. The Earl of Beaconsfield was Prime Minister of England in the 60s, and under his statesmanship, Britain grew to her greatest glory. What was the name of the Earl of Beaconsfield? the answer you two have decided upon? Catherine? No, no, it was, it was Disraeli. Oh. Benjamin Disraeli. I'm sorry, the correct answer is Benjamin Disraeli, so that means the big question next week will be worth $2,000. Well, you lost the big money, but you won $170 in cash, plus $100 for saying the secret word. Congratulations and thanks to both of you. You Bet Your Life is a John Goodell production, transcribed from Hollywood, directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, You Bet Your Life, presented by the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth, two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And don't forget, next week the big question will be worth $2,000. Folks, be sure to see the article about Groucho and You Bet Your Life in the current issue of Look Magazine. Well, Crosby's waiting in the wings, so good night, folks. And remember, just be sure to see your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. <laughs> folks, here's a tip from the National Safety Council. Good drivers don't brag about their ability to get out of tight spots. They stay out of them. This is George Fenneman signing off for more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. March 22nd, 1950, Groucho Marx and You Bet Your Life on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, thanks again to Ted at RadioMemories.com as we head for Pine Ridge, Arkansas and see what's going on with the brand new circus owned by Lum and Abner. This episode was originally broadcast on March 22nd, ready to take you down to Pine Ridge for another visit with Lum and Abner, brought to you by the makers of Horlicks, the original malted milk. And now, let's see what's happening down in Pine Ridge. There was quite a bit of excitement yesterday down at the circus grounds. Squire Skimp had insisted on Abner acting as lion trainer, 
And Abner conceived the idea of putting a glass partition in the cage, which could not be seen from the audience, and yet would permit him to go in the cage without danger. Well, the plan worked fine until the lion crashed through the glass partition right on top of Abner. So as we look in on the old fellows today, we find Lum down at the Jotham Down store. Abner has just entered. Listen. Well, for goodness sakes, Abner, <laughs> you must have been worse hurt than I thought you were. Oh, no, I ain't bad hurt. Elizabeth wrapped all these bandages around on me, said she's afraid that some of them places there might get inflected. Well, that's right, too. Yeah, that lion must have scratched you a heap worse than we thought he did. No, no, it weren't the lion so much as it was that glass he broke. I don't think he scratched me much at all. Mm-hmm. I believe he's about as scared as you was, Abner. <laughs> when he hit that glass, I never seen such a surprised look on a critter's face in my life. Well, I was surprised. Yeah, I mean the lion, though. Oh, yeah, of course, he never knowed that glass was there. Yeah, I don't believe that's a very good idea in the first place, putting that glass partition in there. No, I know now that it ought to have been made out of iron or something like that. I never, I never thought about him jumping through it, you know. I just allowed that he'd sort of catch the glass with his nose there and see he couldn't get through it. Yeah, well, it's a good thing it scared him, for he'd have clawed you to pieces there before we'd got you out of that cage. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I believe I could go in there now, though, Lum, and he'd be scared to jump at me. Well, now, don't you go trying it now. Oh, no, I ain't. I, I just said I believe. Well, there ain't no use for me and you to try to make animal trainers out of ourselves, Abner. We just ain't cut out for that kind of work. No, I, I don't believe we ever need it, huh? Thing for us to do is just get squared or hire somebody to do all them things he's been wanting us to do and forget about it ourselves. Yeah. Granny, he might not have had me talked into laying down on one of them elephants. Letting that elephant sit down on me. For the land. Granny, you ought to have been flattering a pancake. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course... The reason the squire wanted us to do it, you know, Lum, was to save expenses. Yeah, but you notice he ain't taking no chances in being ate up by no animal or nothing. He's figuring on being a ringmaster and a barker. Yeah, barker? Yeah, barking out in front. Well, what's he going to do that for? Well, to get folks to come inside the tent. I don't see how that'll get him in there. Looks to me like that'd run them off. That's the way old Lee, that dog of mine, runs folks off our place over there by barking at them. Yeah, well, that ain't the kind of barking he's going to do, though. He ain't going to bark like no dog, if that's what you mean. Yeah, what's he going to bark like? He ain't going to bark like nothing. He's just going to oh. stand up on the platform out there and give the folks a big talk about what we've got on the inside of the tent. Oh, he, he's going to make a speech, Ann. Well, yeah, that's what it is. Ain't, ain't going to bark at all, huh? No, that's what they call it in the circus business, a barker. Oh. Well, I can't get used to this circus talk. They got to out doing its names for things that I ever seen yes. in my life. <laughs> like Squire calling them lions and tigers cats all the time. Well, quick as Grandpap gets back, we'll go over and see Squire and tell him we he's just gonna have to hire some animal trainer. Uh, uh, whereabouts is Grandpap at? No, oh, he had to make a deliver over at Sister Simpson's boarding house a while ago. Yeah. Uh. I don't want to leave the store here till he gets back. Ah. No, we'll have all we can tend to, Abner, looking after the business end of the circus. Yeah. Selling tickets and buying feed for them animals and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to look after the money end of it now, me and you. I, I, I just don't trust Squire too far, you know. I've still got my doubts about him paying any $50 for that steam tally Well, now, Abner, you don't want to start right out mistrusting Squire. You've got to learn to have more faith and confidence in your fellow man. You ought to be ashamed of yourself doubting Squire that way. Besides, I've done called up the feller he bought it off of and asked him how much Squire paid for it, and he said fifty dollars was the price, all right. Yeah, well, I reckon that I was wrong in special anyway. Oh yeah, I never doubted him a minute, special after I talked to that feller about it. Well, I believe that Squire knows the circus business all right. You can tell that the way he's going ahead and doing things, you know. I just hope that we can make some money out of it, Tom. That's what I hope. Yeah. We've tried might now everything else and ain't had no success. Yeah, we've had some pretty hard knocks, all right. Yeah. But it's like that old Eddard saying, everything comes to him who waits. Everything comes to who? Him. Him who waits. But who's him? Uh, whoever you're talking about. Well, I ain't talking about nobody. You're the one that said that. Well, I was talking about us. 
Uh, which one of us? Well, both of us. When I said everything comes to him who waits, I mean us. Well, why didn't you say us, and you said him? Well, that's the way the saying goes, Abner. Wouldn't sound right to say everything comes to us who waits. Well, if you're talking about us, why, well, it sound all right. I don't see no use in beating around a stump about it. If you mean us, why, well, say us. Uh, well, Abner, that's just an expression. Folks won't get impatient, just sit back and wait. They'll eventually get what they want. Well, I do know. Well, when did they find that out? Oh, that's an old Eddard saying. They've known that for a long time. Well, for goodness sake. You you mean that all a feller's got to do to get something, he just uh, sit back and wait for it? Well, yes and no. Which? Which what? Well, which does he have to do? Well, according to the old saying, if he waits long enough, you get it. You make a success of yourself. Well, I dog it. I reckon old Bob Rollins is right then after all. Bob Rollins? Yeah. What's he got to do with it? Well, if everything comes to him at waits, why, I reckon he'll get that railroad job that he's been waiting for. Oh. <laughs> you know, his woman has been taking in washings now for 15 years, making a living for the family. He says, you know, he's a railroad man. He can't do no other line of work, and yeah. he's a waiting for him to build a railroad through Pine Ridge here, you know. Yeah, no, he says that. Yeah, and I always thought he's just out and out laziness, but <laughs> I see now what he's doing. He, he's waiting to be a success. Instead of him going to the railroad, why, he's trying to bring a railroad to him. Well, I don't believe that'll work out very well on Bob, though, Abner. You can't just sit and wait. You've got to be a go-getter, too. Uh, go-getter? Yeah. Well, you can't be both, Mom. You can be a waiter or you can be a go-getter, but you have to stop waiting, you know, whenever you go get, because when you get up to go get, well, you have to stop waiting. Oh, for goodness sakes, Abner, you'd run a body plumb start crazy. Well, how can a fella go get something and wait at the same time? I don't know. You're getting me mixed up now. What was it I said? Well, I forget myself now just what it was. There you are. Just let it go. Let it go. Uh, here comes Squire Skimp out there. Oh, uh, yeah. We can tell him what we decide about training them animals. Yeah, I want to get out of that if we can, Mom. Well, it just ain't but one thing to do, and that's for us to just come right out flat-footed and refuse to do it. Yeah, but I, I don't believe Squire's going to like that, though, Mom. Well, wait a minute here. Talking this way, me and you is the bosses down there. We own the circus. Huh? Squire's working for us. I know that that's right. Why, he's been bossing me around down there to where I'd plumb forgot about that. Why, sure we are. Well, I'll just let him know who's boss. Now, wait a minute. I better mind out what you're saying there. No. Oh, uh, howdy, Squire. Yeah, come in, Squire. Come in. Well, uh, howdy, man. I've uh, been looking all over for you. Been waiting for you to show up over at the circus ground. Been waiting for it. Well, if you just waited long enough, Squire, why, we'd have been there, you know. Everybody comes to him at wait. Uh, yeah. Shut up, Abner, for goodness. Well, me and I, I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you. I, I don't want to have no hard feelings over it now, but, uh, well, uh, for the good of the circus, I, I believe we ought to make some changes. Make some changes? Uh, yes, you know, I want to have the grand opening tomorrow afternoon, and uh, time is short, man. I've got to work fast. Now what's happened, Squire? Well, I... Sort of hate to tell you, fellas, I know you're going to be disappointed. What is it? What are you driving at? Well, I promised you men that, that you could be the animal trainers, but uh, in order to have to get the circus ready by tomorrow afternoon, why, I had to hire two other fellas this morning to look after that part of the show. And, uh, well, I'll have to ask you gentlemen to just step down and out and... Uh, let these fellas have your place. <laughs> well, 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 sir, that was just what, uh, 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 of course, we both were terrible anxious to have the job, but if you think it's for the better men of the show, I, personal, I'm willing to forget myself and just put the circus first. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, fine, fine. All right, then, it's all set. <laughs> well, it looks like Lum and Abner's Circus is all ready for the grand opening tomorrow. This is Carlton Bricker speaking for Lum and Abner and Horlicks, who now bid you all good night and good health.
From March 22, 1935, Lum and Abner on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Well, it looks like the start of the circus is almost here. And, uh, of course, hopefully with the boys not being in the circus proper, just owning the circus, things will behave and settle down. Another tip of the hat to our friend Ted at RadioMemories.com, who provides us all these fully restored Lum and Abner programs, and you can get them, too, at a very reasonable price uh, just by going to cl- uh, going to RadioMemories.com. That's RadioMemories.com. He supplies shows on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer. RadioMemories.com. And while you're on the interwebs, visit our webpage, ClassicRadio.stream. Stream my shows on demand. Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can contact me, find our social media links, and if you're so inclined, you can buy me a coffee. That buy me a coffee money allows us to uh, uh, acquire additional classic radio theater programs and keep our distribution channels up and running. That's classicradio.stream, classicradio.stream. Thank you so much for tuning in and tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. 